I am angry that my children will have to grow up without a mother. These are the words that were echoed by a distraught father who just lost his wife to a drunk driver. He, his wife, and their three children were just coming back from enjoying a day of fishing. They were less than a mile away from their home when the drunk driver hit them head on with the bulk of the impact hitting on the mother's side. He and his children watched her slowly die in that vehicle. They were helpless and there was nothing that they could do. There are countless stories just like this across the U.S. that tragically take place every single day. Is, is drunk driving a public health hazard? Are there laws and consequences in place that can help you deter drunk driving? What are the solutions that we have to be able to slow down and even stop drunk driving? Drunk driving has been a public health issue in the U.S. for a long time. According to drinkwise.org, drunk driving can give one a false sense of confidence. It can slow your perception, uh, your perception of time. It can even impair your vision and impair your perception of obstacles. Overall, alcohol impaired driving has gone down, but it's still a significant amount of people who are dying. In fact, according to the Department of Transportation, in 2018, there was about 36,835 deaths related to alcohol drink driving. In 2019, it was about 36,096. So that was only about a 2% drop. So yes, it is trending down, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. The Department of Transportation also noted that four out of five people, about 81%, feel that drunk driving is a personal threat to them and to their family. And so according to that, we clearly see that it is an issue and it has horrible effects, not only for the person who's driving drunk, but for those who may be involved in an accident with these with said drunk drivers. The consequences of driving drunk can be life altering. Besides the immediate effects, it can cause an injury to yourself. You can also injure and kill others. Uh, according to the survey here, about 28 people in the U.S. die in drunk driving crashes. That's about one person every 52 minutes. That's that's quite a bit. So in 2019, it stated that about 10,142 people lost their lives. Now this is a trend downward since the NHTSA started recording uh, alcohol-related deaths in at 1982 to now, to 2021. So yes, it is going down, but again, there still needs to be things that are done to stiffen the penalties for such, such actions. And also, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration uh, pointed out that the charges that can be put in place for those who commit uh, alcohol-related injuries can range from misdemeanor to felony. Now, they can include your driver's license revocation, fines, and jail, and even a first-time offense can have uh, legal fees of starting at least 10,000 plus. These consequences though, they do nothing before the fact. They only serve their purpose after an event has occurred. There are measures that are being put in place to deter repeat offenders like ignition interlock devices. These are being paid for out of the owner's expense. They have to pay for it themselves. These vehicles, they cannot operate if the person has a blood alcohol contact of over 0.02%. This is a step in the right direction, but more laws need to be put in place. Uh, according to the book Drunk Driving, uh, the author there talks about a bill that was passed in New York called Leandra's Law, where it makes it a felony to drive when you're intoxicated and transporting children who are under the age of 15. This law was named after a little girl named Leandra who was a passenger 
in her mom's friend's vehicle who was drunk, driving the wrong way, hit another vehicle, and caused the death of Leandra. Her father pushed for this bill to be passed in order that it can stiffen the penalties against those who commit such heinous crimes while drinking and driving. So with this in place, experts even say that they can be about 35 to 65 percent potential re, uh, shut it down. They could prevent about between 35 to 65 potential recurrences of drunk driving. So that is a significant drop. So again, there are some things that we put in place that can help to, uh, for the safety of us and for the safety of those who decide to get behind the wheel and drive. When a, another aspect that's been put into place is the HVE or the high visibility enforcement where they're, they're located at different checkpoints and they stop those that who have the potential to be driving to drive sober to drive who are not driving sober they can they can spot these ones they are trained to see and, and recognize when someone is even buzz driving they might be a little bit drunk they could be swerving but they are able to to detect and deter these ones from getting into a vehicle and hurting others uh, high visibility, they're, what they're do doing is that they're being put in high visibility areas where there are known repeat occurrences of drunk driving incidences. And according to responsibility.org, the reason that this works is because it's, it counters drunk drivers' beliefs that they can avoid detection. They can't. If they're trially trained and they know how to spot such individuals, then they can be they can stop them from causing further harm to themselves and to others. Now, in order for the uh, high visibility enforcement to be effective, they have to be well planned, properly executed, and it has to be highly visible for others to see, and it has to be sustained for a long period of time. Along with the high visibility enforcement, they are it's accompanied by aggressive and complementary uh, informative campaigns such as they have message boards, they have uh, command posts, scene lighting, and they even have a breath alcohol transportation testing vehicle actually that enhances their presence as well. And they even have some judges who are on call who can facilitate into, to obtaining warrants for blood drawn expeditiously. So to keep this person from being able to drive off somewhere they'll be able to have a judge right on, on on hand so that they can immediately get blood drawn. That way the person can't cause any more damage. Uh, there's also other things that are put in place such as the no refusal program, which is a great deterrent as well because it can help them to see the effects of drunk driving. And it may be a, an awakening, a, a rude awakening, something that they need, to, a shock value to see the effects that they're having on others and what damage can be done when they're drunk driving. Uh, one example of the HVE is at the Tennessee checkpoint. They did they did a test over a year by having these enforcers in place. There was a 20.4% drop in reduction in alcohol related crashes. So it does work. They maybe they need even more and even not just on the main roads, but also in areas that are not as known, but do have a high occurrence of alcohol related injuries and deaths as well. And uh, one that was done by Link, uh, they did a test again over a period of a monthly and a weekly, and they showed that they dropped about 40.6%. There's a lower rate when they are when these checkpoints are done weekly and monthly, they consistently drop in those areas. So it is working. Another thing that's put in place is the alcohol service training, where in my opinion, they should be done a lot more frequently than two years because they have training for about three to four hours, give or take, and then they are good for two years which to me, in order to stay on top of things, I would, I would assume that this type of training should be done yearly. 
because it, they need to truly understand the seriousness of what of what their job entails, what can be involved if they continue to serve someone when they know that someone is drunk. Now, according to uh, the AACEA, these ones they can that that those who are servers can handle those who are getting drunk or getting unruly, how to have a customer intervention to make sure to look out for the safety of their customers is to be quick, be clear, and to be firm and to be consistent. And uh, they need to be quick and slowing down that customer service to that person by giving them excess alcohol. They might want to switch it up and give them a non-alcoholic beverage. They want to be clear and firm they want to make sure they stick to their guns and say no no more and not be argumentative they want to be able to try to earn the customer's respect in a way that they understand that they're looking out for their well-being and when being consistent in that they they stand up for their decision they made the decision that's it and they need to not argue they need to walk away and they even get the manager involved if the if the customer becomes so unruly that they can't handle it by themselves. Uh, ultimately, though, no amount of measure can be put in place that can take the place of personal responsibility. It's up to each and every one of us to do our part to not drink and drive. It needs to be hammered into everyone's minds the sad the side effects to themselves to others. And they need to take control of the narrative and actually do things to help themselves have a plan. Uh, there were some tips that were given by the National Highway, uh, National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. If you're going to drink, have a plan and choose a designated driver. If you can't find a driver, hire a taxi, get a ride share. We have Lyft and Uber. There are things that you can do to make sure you get home safely hosting a party, make sure that you have non-alcoholic options there as well and make sure that all of your guests leave with a sober driver. If you're if you are if you are going to host a party and you're not sure about it, if you see that someone is drunk, take their keys away from them. Do not let them leave. Try to find them somebody there who can give them a ride home. Always wear a seatbelt. That even though it can't prevent everything, it can be something that is that is useful to you. It's the best defense that you can have against a drunk driver. And if you see a drunk driver on the road, safely pull over and call law enforcement because you don't want to keep you don't want to be a part of that accident if they are driving say down the wrong way and you see them coming. Don't stay on the road where they can or in in they in the area where they could cause damage to you. Safely get out of the way, call law enforcement so that they can go in and be able to possibly save this person's life as well. And if you have an alcoholic drink, you need to be self-aware self -aware and don't get drunk. Even buzz driving can be a, can cause impaired driving and that could be bad for you. Also, you need to realize that you don't have to drink every time you go out. Some people drink only at functions, uh, at parties, at showers, at barbecues. They don't drink every single day to get drunk, but when they go to special occasions, that's when they get drunk. Realize that you don't have to drink every time you go out. Just have a regular drink, have a tea, water, or something. You don't have to get drunk every time yet you go out. And if you realize that you have a drinking problem, seek help. You know if, if several people have come to you and expressed concern about your drinking, you might have a problem and you need to go and find the things that are put in place to help you to get over such drinking and driving. And it's for your own safety and for your own health. Now, all these steps are not that are put in place, they're not foolproof, but we, again, we all can do our, our part in decreasing drunk driving incidences. As this nation, it is going toward a downward trend, and we can continue to do our part by staying aggressive in our bid to end the senseless tragedy of drinking and driving in the U.S. We can all do our part 
to all make it home safely.